doing okay? Yeah? No? It's okay if you're not. We can have a chat about that afterwards. <laughs> it's all right to have a little bit of back and forth. I know we say that a lot, but it seems like we have to sometimes. I'm going to be asking you a few questions this morning, and when I do, I, w- I would like a bit of a response. Um, let's, let's start off with one, actually. How, how many of you are still going with the reading plan? By way of a show of hands. Okay, a few of you. That's fine. Um, it's not easy, is it, to maintain that amount of reading every day. But can I encourage you now, we've, we've just reached the end of the Gospels this morning. Um, you can join in from now if you'd like to. We're going to be starting to read through the book of Acts, uh, which is, as you're aware, a fantastic book, as are all the rest of them. Uh, but those of you who have done at least part of the reading plan, have you found it helpful? Yeah? Do you feel like you've, you've gained a little bit of biblical knowledge? Yeah? Have you got the big picture? Slightly. We've not got to the end yet, so we don't know how it ends. Um, those of you that do, don't do spoiler alerts, all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's not ruin it for those who haven't got there yet. We're uh, starting off a new series today, um, looking at the therefores of the New Testament. And the, the series is helpfully titled, Therefore. Uh, it's a word that's used a number of times throughout the New Testament. We're not going to be able to look at all of them. I read out one of them just now. Um, and it's, it's a connecting word, isn't it, therefore? You, have, you make a statement, and then, therefore, there's a consequence. I think, therefore, I am, as Rene Descartes famously said. Or perhaps in a more modern context, we went out to lunch yesterday, and therefore, we posted a picture on Instagram. Or maybe, I might preach for a bit too long this morning, therefore you might fall asleep on the shoulder of the person next to you. You might not know them that well, therefore it could be awkward. You get the picture, right? And whenever therefore appears in scripture, we need to look at what came before it and then what comes after it, because it's a pivotal word. What was the initial statement? What's the consequence of that statement? And so in this series we're going to be taking a look at a few of those therefore statements in scripture. But before we dive into that, let me ask you another question. What is the point of church? Why don't you shout a few things out? I'm going to do some scribbles over here. What's the point of church? Why are we here? Serve God? Great. Apologies for my awful handwriting, by the way. I often find when I write on things like this that I start off relatively big And as I go down, I not only get smaller, but I go diagonal. So just prepare yourselves for that. Any more suggestions? What are we here for? What's the point of church? Praise God. God. Excellent. Yeah, we've just spent a decent amount of time doing that this morning. Oh, it's already begun. (laughs) Encourage one another. Any more for any more? The sermon. (laughs) Thank you, Dean. (laughs) Anything else? Community. Excellent. Yeah, very important. Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah, we probably put that in with community. Any more? Tea and coffee. (laughs) Dean's saying that because his connect group are serving tea and coffee today. (laughs) Anything else? Reach out to the lost, yeah? What was that back there? To feel blessed. Let's have one more. Who's feeling brave? We haven't had any from this side yet. I'm going to pick you up. Pray for one another. We'll go with that. Sorry, that side. You got beaten to the post there. I just put an E on the end of four. That's embarrassing. (laughs) Therefore, thank you, Pete. (laughs) So, do we think we've summed up what church is for there? 
Yeah? Well, all of these things are, are true and really important. But I can feel a diagram coming on, can't you? With our staff team, we've been reading through a book called Saturate by a man called Jeff Vanderstelt, which I think is a fantastic name, isn't it? Vanderstelt. Uh, <clears throat> it's all about being saturated by Jesus and what that means as we live out our daily life. And in the book, he, he gives this diagram to explain what he believes the church is all about. I'm going to attempt to recreate it, but I have to admit, Banksy I ain't, so it might not be the best artwork you've ever seen. But here is a lovely picture of a church. Yeah? Church, right? Some people think that church is all about the building. Church is a place where we go on a Sunday morning, and while we're there, we we sing some lovely songs, we pray, uh, we hear a sermon, drink some tea and coffee, and we go home. That's church. Other people say that church is all about events and programs that happen in the building. The Sunday service being one of them, perhaps Alpha, perhaps other courses that we might run. Other people might think that church is all about the leaders, the pastors. And there's a little skirt because Annie's a girl. People might think then that the job of the leaders and the pastors is to, is to encourage people to invite their friends to come to the events that happen in the building. So far we've not really gone wrong, have we? I mean, none of that is, is incorrect, is it? No? No. Good, thank you. <laughs> I feel slightly reassured now. And still, so more people might think that the job of the pastors is to encourage us to give our money, that is a pound sign, <laughs> or to give our time, or to give our gifts and our talents to facilitate the stuff that happens in the building. Now, all of those things are true, and they're right, they're good, but it's not what church is all about, is it? No. I think we all know what church is all about, don't we, folks? We're getting a little bit of a hint now. We've we've made a great list. See, we're called not to go to church, but to be church. Isn't that right? We're supposed to be church. And so today's therefore, uh, we're going to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. If you've got your Bible, would you uh, switch it on or open it? I've brought my paper Bible for the occasion. So reading from verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. At this point, Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, and he's been raised again to new life and he gathers his disciples on a mountain near Galilee and he gives them what we would call the great commission we're all familiar with that verse I'm sure those of us who've been in church for a while at least will have heard that verse many many times and he makes this really bold statement he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me all authority it's what we've just sung about It's what we just prayed about. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he humbled himself, didn't he? The the previous part of the verse that I read earlier talks about Jesus' humility, the way that he, uh, he emptied himself of his holiness, of his sovereignty, becoming fully man and fully God. He submitted to the Father's will in sacrificing himself, and now He's come into his reward for that. All authority has been given to him. He's taken up his full rights as God once again. Now there's a a doctrine in in the church known as missio dei. That's a little bit of Latin for you. It means the mission of God. 
Um, there are lots of different theories about what this means, but one basic summary of it would be that God the Father sent Jesus, God the Son. We, you're agreeing with it so far, aren't you? Yeah? And then God the Father and God the Son sent God the Holy Spirit to equip, equip the church. Makes sense so far, doesn't it? Now, there's a little bit extra to this, um, which for some reason we forgot about for many years as the church. And that is that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit send the church to make disciples in this world. See, church, we, we come here to worship and we are being church. But the purpose of that is to be on the mission of God in this world. And that's the therefore to which Jesus is building now. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He frames this command within his own sovereignty. There can be no doubt about Jesus' right to make this command of us. All authority has been given to him. And therefore, in that authority, he commands us to go and make disciples of all nations. So, another question for you. Tell you what, this flip chart hasn't seen this much use in ages. What does it mean for us to make disciples? How do we do that? What is a disciple to start off with? Anyone? Follower of Jesus, yeah? Okay. Right. That's a good start, isn't it? So how do we encourage people to become that? What does it mean for us to make disciples? Befriend Befriend people, yeah, great. Yeah, okay, obey, yeah, obey Jesus. Yeah, very important. We can't expect people to become a disciple of Jesus if they've never met him, can we? Anything else? What does it mean for us to make disciples? Be an example. Be an example, yeah, absolutely. So in the way that we live, the way that we interact with people, the way we respond to situations, we're being an example of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. Okay, we'll leave it there. That's, that's a decent start. Now being a disciple means submitting our lives to Jesus. It means committing to living our lives his way so that we might be changed more and more into his likeness. That's discipleship in a nutshell. And so, yes, a disciple is a follower of Jesus, but there's more to it than that. Because I could follow all sorts of people. Just look at my Twitter account. Being a disciple means that we've seen Jesus, we've encountered him, and what we've seen in him has so blown us away that our lives could never be the same again. We don't just say, well, I'm going to... I'm going to follow you, but I'm, I'm going to commit to be like you. I want to, be an, I want to not be me anymore. I want to be you. And that was, the, that was the Jewish tradition of discipleship. People would seek out a rabbi who they admired, and they would sit at his feet and learn from him. They would follow him around and discover what made him tick. And then they would start to regurgitate his teaching and then eventually develop their own. But the point of it was that they were becoming like the person they were following. So the goal of our followership of Jesus is to become like Jesus. Reggie McNeil, uh, writer of the book, The Missional Renaissance, says this, we must change our ideas of what it means to develop a disciple, shifting the emphasis from studying Jesus and all things spiritual in an environment protected from the world to following Jesus into the world to join him on his redemptive mission. So, 
The question that I asked myself as I was reading this this week, if we're going to make disciples, well, how did Jesus do it? That's a good place to start. How did Jesus make disciples? And we find it in Matthew chapter 4. You needn't turn to it. I'm just going to read the one verse. Verse 19, he says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus invited his disciples to join him on mission. And while they were on mission, he taught them how to make disciples. You see, I think sometimes we, we get this a little bit backwards. We feel like we need to be discipled to the point where we are prepared to go on mission. We need to learn so that we then know enough to disciple others. Well, that's partly true. We do need to learn. But I think that we've got it a little bit backwards if we say that we, we're not learned enough to do mission. Because Jesus calls these men out of the boats, uneducated fishermen. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He doesn't say, follow me and I will show you how to listen to a sermon properly. He doesn't say, follow me to a Bible college class where you'll get your degree. He doesn't say, follow me to a pile of books that you need to read before you can come out on mission with me. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, being on mission is scary. It is, because mission pushes us out of our comfort zones. It exposes our imperfections. Now, a lot of us, we might feel like we, we can't possibly go out on mission, whatever that means, because we're not good enough. I don't know enough. I've not been a Christian for long enough. Or I'm still struggling with this sin. Or I still don't understand all of the depths of eschatology. But I think that that's the point of mission. The point of mission, as well as to reach out to people, is to show us that we need Jesus' grace just as much as everybody else does. We've got a team out in Cambodia at the moment on mission. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the updates that have come through on Facebook, but really exciting stuff that's happening. And uh, I saw on Instagram this morning, Ian sent me a little post saying that they've, they've spent their first day with the villagers you remember we took an offering to pay for the villagers from the church plant to come into the city. Well, they've come into the city. They spent the first day with them, and seven of them have got saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> seven new lives in the kingdom. It's good news, isn't it? Yeah. Now, they're spending another day with these people today in the city, so I'm sure we'll hear more reports of what God's doing amongst them. But the thing is, Mission is about more than just what we give. I was chatting to Duncan Logan last week. Um, he was just sharing some of his experiences about uh, short-term mission trips that he's been on. And his reflection was that he went out there feeling like he was going to give loads and really excited about what God was going to do through him and how all the people around him were going to be impacted. And he came back feeling like he'd been impacted far more than the people that he'd gone out there to serve. And I think that's the experience of Jesus' disciples as well. Maybe. We don't know what they saw in Jesus or what Jesus might have said to them uh, prior to or just after calling them. They might have felt like, we're going to be part of something big here, we're going to bless a lot of people. And they were. But they also grew. They became the pillars of the early church. The, the men and also women who followed Jesus who created this thing that we're now a part of in partnership with the Holy Spirit. They sacrificed, they died. And they were prepared to do that because of the work of the Spirit in them, the way that they had grown. Now, I've talked about mission in Cambodia, but we need to understand that mission isn't just about going overseas for a short period of time. We need to understand that we're on mission all the time. When I, when I was inducted into this church, I, I said I, I felt that I'd been called as a missionary to Selly Oak. 
And, and I hope that that's a call that you also feel. Some of you have come from far afield, perhaps to study, perhaps for other reasons. Some of you have been born and raised here. But each of us is a missionary placed in our communities. We might not be church planters. We might not be doctors without borders. We might not be civil engineers building roads into hard-to-reach villages. But we are missionaries. So how do we do that? Jesus gives us a couple of things. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is important, isn't it? If you haven't been baptized, I encourage you, come along to this baptism class tomorrow. Find out more. Baptism is a symbol of our dedication to Jesus. It's a symbol of the decision we've already made to be his disciples. And that's why we do it publicly, because it's supposed to be a declaration. It says, my old life is dead and my new life is here. And he says this, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Somebody said it earlier, we've got to obey Jesus. If we're going to be disciples of Jesus, then our lives have to line up with what he has to say about things. We can't expect new disciples to automatically obey everything Jesus taught. There's a bit of a, a phrase that people use. Um, I'm not, I think it's a good phrase. I mean, we don't use it all the time. But they say that th- there's a three B's of becoming a Christian. Right? Believing, belonging, behaving. So we believe first. And then we join a church. And we belong in that family. And throughout that process, we begin to behave differently. And again, it's something that we've sometimes got a bit backwards. Maybe we've been out doing evangelism or speaking to somebody who, who doesn't know Jesus and perhaps they, they're behaving in a way that, that we don't appreciate, that isn't biblical, and we call them out for it. We say, you shouldn't be doing that. But why? What reason do they have to put their lives under the teaching of Jesus until they've met him? Once they've met him, absolutely, let's help them to to change some things. But we can't expect people to just do it automatically, can we? They might not even be aware of Jesus' teachings. And that's increasingly the case in our society. We're having second, third, fourth generation unchurched people that we're coming into contact with. Only heard the name of Jesus as a swear word. They're not going to know a thing about what he had to say about stuff. Now... I think it's important to say that teaching people how to obey the commandments of Jesus is not something that's just for the pastors to do. So we have about 45 minutes, give or take an hour or two, to speak to you on a Sunday morning. And it's normally on one topic, and we might go into a little bit of depth. And it's, it's valuable, it's good. I'm not about to preach myself out of a job, but... It's not the be-all and end-all. Like we say about everything else in church, and discipling our kids, our young people, ourselves, we have this two-hour slot or hour-and-a-half slot on a Sunday morning where we're together, and then the rest of the week, um, somebody with better arithmetic skills than me could tell me how many hours that is. The rest of the week, we're out there. We're just living our lives. And so if we leave the teaching of Jesus' word just to the people who speak on the platform on a Sunday morning, we're not going to grow very quickly, and neither are the people around us. Now, you don't have to be theologically trained. That might be quite reassuring to some of you. (laughs) Your job is to teach using what you yourself know and what you've experienced. Now, if you feel like you lack knowledge and experience... Find somebody to do mission with. Join a connect group. See, we, we're about the mission of God together. So if you're not in a connect group, by the way, can I encourage you to speak to Grace afterwards? 
pick up one of our flyers about this. It's, Sunday morning is great, but if you really are serious about growing in your discipleship walk with Jesus, you need to join a connect group. Unless you're like super disciplined and you read all of the books, but even still, you're doing it on your own and you're going to be missing something. Doing mission on your own can be fatal, but if we do it together, it can be powerful. So let's go back to our diagram of the church. Here it is. Oh, I forgot how good that was. <laughs> Jesus commands us to go and make disciples. That means we can't just focus on what happens inside this building. And it's not that what happens in here isn't good. I love our gathered services on a Sunday. It's one of my favorite times of the week. I could have carried on worshiping with you for hours, probably, if, if I wasn't also thinking about how long it would take to fit 45 minutes worth of material into five minutes. I love gathered services. I love church on a Sunday. But we are the church, whether we're gathered here or we're scattered throughout the city. So wherever we go, we take the body of Christ with us. We're called to go out from this place because after all, we spend such a small proportion of our lives here. That's our focus. Everything that we do here is brilliant. I'm not saying that because I'm part of planning some of it. Because God's involved in it. We come here and we spend time in his presence. We worship together. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. All of those things that we listed before. We drink tea and coffee together. I mean, we laugh about that, but it's important. Not so much the kind of beverage, but the time that we spend together. Francis Chan says this. Christians are like manure. Spread them out and they help everything grow better, but keep them in one big pile and they stink horribly. <laughs> Let's not be a big stinking pile of Christians. <clears throat> On the wall back there we have a giant poster that sums up what we want to see happen in this city. And you know that our, our mission statement is to disciple our city by equipping people to become fully committed followers of Jesus. You did know that, didn't you? Yeah, okay. If you didn't, that's it. It's on all of our literature, so if you want to memorize it, just grab one of our leaflets. And our vision for the future, as it says on that poster, is to be a multi-generational, multi-service, multi-site congregation. Thousands of passionate people, gripped by grace, and committed to blessing our city one person at a time. I don't know about you, but that excites me. Not necessarily because of the numbers, but the idea of blessing our city in the name of Jesus. It gets me fired up. That's why I'm here. It's why I do what I do. And I hope that you, you've caught something of that in your time with us. Because that's what we're all about. Some of those things are future tense. Yeah, we're not multi-service. We're not multi-site. We don't have thousands of people. But in the here and now, we can be a blessing to our city. We can be passionate about Jesus and gripped by grace. Now, you don't have to go out on the streets and preach. In fact, it's probably best for most of you not to do that. Just because we'd be flooded with too many Christians shouting at everybody. People don't like to be preached at. But making disciples can be as simple as showing people that you care. And we want to be a blessing to our city. And so that is the starting point for our disciple making. Blessing the people around us. Let me read you a couple of quotes. Gordon MacDonald says, In a heartless world, the generosity and service of the first Christians was such a stunning contrast that people everywhere sat up and took notice. It's fair to speculate that Christian generosity and service did more to win people to the gospel of Christ than all the preaching that was done. 
Generosity was a hallmark of the early church. If I had time, I'd open up Acts chapter 2 and we'd have a a really good uh, discussion into what the church was always supposed to be about. We don't have time for that, but I encourage you, you'll, you'll get to it in the reading plan anyway. Spend a bit of time looking at that. And then think, what does that look like for us? In my connect group, in my street. Generous people change the world by showing the world what God looks like. And he is the ultimate giver. We're most like God when we give, says Jeff Lucas. And I agree with him. If we're going to obey Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations, a good place for us to start is to be generous to people around us. And when we bless people, it, it creates opportunities for us to tell them about Jesus. Um, you probably remember that we've got these business cards at the back of the welcome desk. We've been telling you about them for a little while. I wonder, has anybody who, who took a stack of these had an opportunity to use them yet? Great, fantastic. Ian told me a story of uh, how it went a little bit wrong for him. And I haven't checked with him that it's all right to tell this story. So (laughs) I'll just apologize later if he actually watches this on YouTube. Hi, Ian. He was having lunch somewhere with a friend and um, spotted a a police officer that he used to know from his time in West Bromwich. He was out with his family, and he decided that he was going to pay for their meal. And so went to the waitress who was serving them and said, look, just don't don't say anything, but can you just tell these people that somebody has paid for their meal and given this card? He didn't want any kind of recognition for it. He knew the guy would know him if he saw him, and it might be a little bit awkward. The waitress didn't get the message. (laughs) So she took the, the paid bill over to the table, with the card, and said, you see that guy over there? (laughs) I mean, Ian still had an opportunity to explain why he'd done that for the person, and maybe that was a better thing to happen, but certainly wasn't what he'd planned for. If you are unsure of how to share the gospel with somebody, but you do have the ability to bless them, you can use these cards. On the back is a QR code that they can scan with their smartphone, It'll take them to our website, and there they will find a video, just one-minute video that explains the essence of the gospel. When I made these, I got quite excited about it because I can see the potential of what could happen in this city if loads of us started to go out of our way to be generous to the people around us. Now, if you feel a little bit daunted by that prospect, I want to say to you that that's all right. You're actually in the majority. I don't want you to feel like you're the worst possible Christian because the idea of sharing your faith with somebody scares you. I think that's probably most of us, isn't it? A couple of the brave ones are nodding. Most of us aren't evangelists with a capital E. And even those of us that are, don't always find it easy. But it is important. And we have this encouragement from Jesus. Jesus' disciples would probably have been every bit as daunted as we are by this great commission. Even after all that they'd seen and experienced with Jesus. We see in the verses just before Jesus starts to speak, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They'd come into contact with the resurrected Jesus, who three days previously they'd seen on a cross. And still they doubted. Does that encourage you? None of us have, well, I'm going to make a sweeping statement here. None of us have seen the risen Jesus, probably. So I think it's all right that we might have doubts from time to time if people that were with him also doubted. But Jesus, I think, preempted their fears. They didn't have a a chance to say to him, well, Jesus, 
you're going away, wouldn't you? It wouldn't be much better if you just stayed. We're so scared, we're frightened at the prospect of what you're asking us to do. And he says, surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. Surely I am with you always until the very end of the age. A couple of the other Gospels, when they relay this moment, also note that Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit. And he sends the disciples back to Jerusalem. He says, wait until the Holy Spirit comes. See, we're about the mission of God, but we're not doing it on our own. We have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to experience the gifts of the Spirit, which we can use to encourage one another, but also to facilitate mission out there. And if we are filled with the Spirit, then we're never truly alone on this mission. Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Everything is under his power, including all of those people who reject him, including ISIS, including illness, including natural disasters. Everything is under his power. And this Jesus, who is supreme over all things, calls us to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And that is the purpose for which the church exists. Yes, we gather. Yes, we pray together. Yes, we experience the presence of God. And those things are for our benefit, but they're also for mission. Scott and the band, would you come and join me up on the platform? I wonder, as you're sitting here listening to me, just think through your week. Think about the people with whom you come into contact. Who is there in your life who you could encourage to be a disciple of Jesus? You might not have a straightforward answer to that question, I know, personally, I, it's something that I, I find that quite hard to answer. Because in the context of my work, probably loads of people. But I don't have the benefit of working with non-Christians. We, uh, we try and spend a bit of time speaking to the nursery staff here. Most of them don't know the Lord, and so we take any opportunity we can get to share the gospel with them. Or just to be kind to them, really. But if you're sat here thinking, this is not easy, I can't do this, I'm with you. It's not easy. Over on the wall, just to further along from the other poster, we've got a prayer wall. Those of you who were with us a few weeks ago will remember that we, we took a moment to write down the name of somebody we were praying for to come to faith. And we stuck them up on that wall. I wonder, has has anybody come to faith whose name we've put on there? Okay. I didn't think so. I want to encourage you to continue praying for those people. If you're somebody who put a name up on the board, continue praying for them. But also think to yourself, what can I do? Is there some way that I can reach out to them? Is there a need that they have that I can meet? Can I simply invite them round for a meal? Not so that we can just throw the gospel at them, but so that we can befriend them, as someone said earlier. It's interesting that any time I go into the city centre, I tend to see some guys out there doing a bit of street preaching. And often the content of what they have to say is true, but it's not loving. When we look at Jesus, 
We look at the way he spoke to people. It wasn't the non-believers that he was harsh with. He called out the Pharisees time and time again, told them they were the sons of Satan. The kind of thing that I hear people saying to somebody who looks like they might be gay walking down the street. Jesus comes to those people and he says, follow me. He shows them value. He went to eat with Zacchaeus, the most hated man in town. He touched the lepers. He fed the hungry, healed the sick and challenged dead religion. We're about the mission of God in this city, on this earth. Jesus has called us to make disciples of all nations. Well, let's start here in Birmingham. Well, let's do it like Jesus. Should we pray together? And if, as you've been listening, a name has come into your head of somebody who you think you would like to pray for, you would like to begin to bless there are still some of these coloured cards down here to go on the prayer wall if at the end of the service you want to come and just write that name on a card stick it up on the wall commit to pray for them commit to be generous to them for the sake of Jesus and his gospel Father, we don't always find it easy to fulfill the commission that you've given us. It's a big job. And we thank you that we don't do it alone. God, I want to pray for my friends here this morning, whether they're feeling energized by what they've heard or daunted by the prospect of reaching out to their friends and neighbours I pray for a fresh touch of your Holy Spirit right now ask that you would come in power equip us by your spirit to carry out your mission We submit ourselves to you. We are your disciples. And so we ask, Lord, that by your influence in our lives, we would continue to grow more into the likeness of Jesus. We ask that through your Holy Spirit in us, you would enable us to live more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. And even more tomorrow than we did today that we might be a blessing to our city. In the name of Jesus. Amen.